Good morning. We'll be uh, starting up our webinar in about uh, four minutes or so at nine o'clock. Good morning. We'll be starting up in about three minutes. We're just letting people log in and uh, welcome on Zoom for those who are dialed in. We'll be starting up in about two minutes. Welcome those who are coming in via Zoom and also those who are joining us via Facebook Live. Good morning. We'll be starting up in about one minute at the top of the hour. Good morning and uh, welcome to our Tuesday webinar. I'm David Orr, the director here at the Cornell Local Roads Program, and uh, we're going to get started. Let's get my mouse moving here so we can start the session. Uh, just so you know, a lot of the materials we're going to talk about today are in our Asphalt Paving Principles workbook that goes with the workshop. Uh, that's available at the website that you've seen up on our screen right now. We'll also put a copy of the, a link to that with the recording of this webinar that'll be on our information highway page on our website. And uh, that'll be listed at the end of the session as well. Uh, for those who haven't been with us before, just as a couple of reminders, the chat has been disabled, um, but you can put in your questions via the Q&A panel by moving your mouse to the bottom of the screen. And I'll probably ask you to raise your hand now and then to use the raised hand feature to answer some questions as we go through. And we'll probably be doing some polls. In fact, we'll do one here in just a couple of minutes. For those who are uh, trying to get professional development hours for engineering, uh, yes, this is worth one PDH here in New York State. Only the person who's registered is able to get that. Uh, it is counted as a course, however, which is good. To get that, you're going to just send us your certificate of attendance, which you'll get if you stay for about 75% uh, of the session. To get the PDH, you need to stay for the entire session, uh, at least 90% or more. If you're from another state, you're calling in, 
please be aware, uh, you'll need to contact your LTAP center in your state to see what the rules are and whether this is worth the PDH or not. Now, this particular webinar is paving an engineer's perspective. Our uh, primary circuit writer for our pavement maintenance and asphalt paving course courses, uh, Gary Nelson, he actually did a 24 minute video on a practitioner's perspective. And I would uh, tell you that it's actually a good video. It's worth watching. It's uh, fairly brief, uh, covers sort of the practitioner's side of the house. And as you watch that video, you're going to see some overlap. Uh, if both Gary and I think it's a pretty critical item, that's probably something you need to pay attention to. But there's some really good information in there. And uh, I would advise looking at that as well, uh, if you're interested and concerned about the paving side of the house. Now we're talking today about an engineering perspective, but what we're really doing is we're looking for a better pavement. Uh, this actually is some pictures from some testing that was done when they were developing the design protocols. But the thing to remember is this, at the end of the day, you want to build the road to handle the load. And that's the idea of pavement, okay? And so what I wanna do is go through what, as an engineer, I'm looking for, or as a manager, not the person actually doing the paving. And then you can watch Gary's uh, excellent video to get sort of the practitioner's side of the house. So one of the first things we want to talk about is designing enough thickness. Now, we have a one-hour webinar today. We're not going to get into designing enough thickness. But you can design even a gravel road to handle some pretty hefty loads. This is out of Australia. And you can see this is a pretty hefty-looking truck. Yes, this is one truck on a gravel road. And you, it will work if you've designed for it properly. If you're really interested in that, though, I'd advise you go back to our information highway and look up the thickness design of low volume pavements. Uh, it was held on June 16th. You can watch the recording. Okay. Now, as we get into the rest of the webinar, let me start with the poll. First poll for the day. I'm going to launch this poll. And I want you to just help me out as I'm going through the rest of this and see who's in the room. So how many folks are at your site? Who do you work for? And then scroll down to see how long have you been at your job. If you could fill that out for me, that would be very helpful. Okay, I'll wait till I get about, oh, 60% of you having dialed in. Okay, we'll end that polling. Share the results. Uh, so most of you are by yourself. Uh, a couple of you have a large group, uh, hopefully social distance and all that fun stuff. A lot working for local government, so a few consultants. And we have two people working for the weekend. Uh, my big challenge with the weekend is remembering which day is which. But uh, how long have you been at your job? Quite a range, but a lot of you more than 10 years. But that's okay. That, that helps me actually so I can maybe skip a couple of things, a little more detail than others as we go through this. And we'll come back. We we'll actually use the polls quite a bit this morning. Okay. So. When we're talking about pavements, one of the biggest things that uh, I see as I go around the state, as I've seen pavement that's being, uh, paving that's done, is making sure we choose the right candidate. Uh, there's no point in putting paving down on a roadway that's not ready for it. Uh, have you taken care of the cracks? Have you filled the potholes? Is the foundation ready? Uh, certainly, I would not want to be put pavement down on top of this. It's not going to last you'd have to do all the work with the asphalt and asphalt's way too expensive uh, to spend it to do all of the work. You really wanna have the foundation, the gravel, the subgrade, the unbound layers doing a lot of the work just, just to help everybody out. If you wouldn't mind in the Q and A uh, issue, if you can, put in how much you're currently paying for asphalt at the plant, not in place, but at the plant, just the cost of it at the, at the plant. Let's see if people give me some answers here. I'm just curious what people are paying this spring and then the summer. What are you paying at the plant for hot mix asphalt? $69 a ton. Okay, that's one answer. 72, pretty close. That's not too bad different. 72, ooh, under 50. That's pretty good, under $50. Yeah, I'd, I'd take that price, but there'll be quite a variation that exists. I do know there are places in the state, we had this in our webinar last week, uh, that are over $100 a ton. 
just getting it to the facility. It's a little less at the plant, but by the time you ship it to the site, it gets pretty dang expensive. And it does depend on the plant and the shipping cost and all that fun stuff. But the point is you don't want to put all your money into the asphalt layer, especially in the local system. We really need to put our money into making sure the foundation is ready. And that foundation can be unbound materials. You can use wrap. Uh, this is actually the main road to the center of campus here at Cornell about uh, 15, 20 years ago when they rebuilt it. And they actually used wrap as the base found of the roadway. And if it's got the right gradation, if it's compacted properly, it can actually make a great foundation. Um, and that's actually what they did. That road held up fine until they had to rebuild it because of some work on uh, some steam lines. So make sure the foundation is ready. And whether that foundation is plain bank run, uh, stabilized, this is actually a cement stabilized surface, make sure it's available to do the job, do the work. And if you're gonna put an overlay down, do me a favor, pick good candidates, okay? The two on the outside, the left and the right, they're not good candidates. They're way too many cracks. They're gonna reflect right back through. And as a good rule of thumb, a uh, nice solid crack is gonna come through about one inch of asphalt in about a year. So if you've got three or four inches of asphalt, you're only gonna get three or four years before those cracks start to reappear. And that's just assuming a low volume. If there's any kind of traffic, it could come back even faster. And even that one in the center is gonna have problems. It's just a little too much cracking. Can you do crack repairs on it? If you can't properly do crack repairs, then you probably wanna be thinking about doing something other than just a plain overlay. It's a little bit too late. You wanna catch it early. This is actually a picture uh, was of a Nova chip, which is, you know, essentially a very, very thin hot mix asphalt pavement. And the reason I like this particular photograph more than anything else is you'll notice in the lane that they're not putting the Nova chip down, they've done their crack repairs ahead of time. Now, how soon before you do the crack, rep uh, the paving, should you put the crack repairs down? You know, if you wanted to pave right now in the month of July, when should you have done the crack repairs? If you could put that in the Q&A pod for me, when would you put that? Last year? Yeah, that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, if you could do it last year, that'd be great. Gives it plenty of time to work and things like that. As a minimum, I like to see at least a month, really a season is the way I think about it. So you need not only time for it to cure out, but to also see did you get everything. So if I was going to be paving now, I would want to have done that probably in April. And actually, April, March and April, if the weather is dry, is some of the best time to actually do crack repairs if they're moving. And the key with crack repairs is pick good candidates. Just like paving, pick good candidates and do them well. Uh, the one on the left would not be good for a motorcycle, and actually, the cracks are going to reflect through that actually faster than you think. The one picture on the right, wasn't done very well, you can actually pull the crack repair material right up out of the crack. That's not gonna really do that much good. You gotta be careful about putting paving over rutting, okay? The upper left photograph, could you pave that? Could you put an overlay on top of that rutting? What do you think? No, I probably wouldn't. If, if it was stable, uh, maybe you might be able to do that if you put in a shim course first and then put the overlay down. But if you try to pave that in a single pass, traffic is going to put it right back. You're going to have running again. And a lot of times it's not really a stable mix. The one on the right, if you paved over the top of that, it would be a problem. Okay. Now, somebody put into the Q&A pod, are you assuming the pavement surface is milled first? You could do that. You could mill it flat and then you'd have a nice foundation, just like a gravel foundation, to pave on top of. And that actually is a really good technique, a mill and fill type operation to get a flat surface. But that assumes the mix is stable. If the mix is moving, as in the lower right photograph, you could mill that flat, but that underlying mix is probably still unstable and it's gonna move with traffic. So make sure you understand what's gonna happen. Pick good candidates before you do the overlay, okay? And we won't even get into potholes. This is Gary uh, Nelson out on the job. Uh, he found a really big pothole, but he did get out of it before they paved it. But do me a favor. If you've got potholes, you probably have problems underneath. Make sure you take care of those problems before you fix them. So now we're gonna 
do our first uh, question. We're doing a poll thing today. And let me pull the poll up. And so, so what do you think is the best technique? What a technique is the best choice for this road? You can select A, B, C, and D. I'm gonna launch the polling. Is it an overlay, a mill and fill, recycling, or full depth reclamation? What would you, given those four choices, what would you choose? I get at least half of you voting. Okay. And so actually every single choice got at least one vote with uh, full depth reclamation getting the most, uh, mill and fill and recycling getting a pretty good even mix. Both of them got eight votes apiece. Okay, as you can see, here's the result. Why do you think there's such a variation? Why do you think it's really hard to tell from just a single photograph? What's going on? You can't see the whole picture. Yeah. And it's really hard to tell just by looking at the surface either. The surface doesn't tell you what's going on underneath. Absolutely, Gary. You got to see what's going on underneath. That's why you've got to do some tests. You've got to know something about the history of the roadway, the foundation that's underneath it. If, if the foundation's good, this is probably a pretty good candidate for recycling or a mill and fill, depending upon other factors. But if there's a base problem, if those cracks are because of a base issue, you're going to have to go something more extensive, like a full depth reclamation. Um, it, it definitely is not a candidate for a straight overlay. You're going to have to do something otherwise those cracks are going to reflect back through. It's not a good candidate in that particular case, but pick good candidates. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is choosing the right mix. What mix of asphalt are we going to be putting down on top of it? Now, just again, put it in the Q&A pod for me. What percentage of, what is the percentage of asphalt in uh, asphalt concrete? Okay, we call it asphalt concrete. It's really not concrete in the traditional cemented together. It's bound together with the asphalt. But what, what is the percentage of asphalt in most concrete mixes? What do you think? Five point five percent. Somebody pretty precise. Fifteen. Eight to nine. There should be a range, as you would imagine. There's quite a bit of a range, depending upon the kind of mix that you're using, hot, cold, warm. Uh, is it open graded? Is it dense graded? Things like that. But the reality is, when you start looking at it and you break it down, you're going to see that the amount of asphalt is actually relatively small. The range is 3 to 8%, depending on the mix. Okay. There are some very specialized mixes with more. Three would be an open graded in specific cases. But the point is, there's a range. Asphalt is a small percentage and you don't drive on asphalt. You actually drive on rocks, aggregates, okay? Coarse aggregates and fine aggregates. The asphalt's just there to bind everything together. So you really need good aggregates, absolutely need them. That's where the strength comes from. The asphalt is just holding it together. We'll talk first, though, about the stuff that's holding to together, the asphalt. And uh, these days, we use what are called performance-graded or PG-graded binders. We've been using PG binders for over 20 years. Even if you buy the old Marshall-style mixes, we've used PG binders since the late 90s, just because they make the super-grade PG binder, and we just used it in other mixes. And Performance grade is based on climate, traffic, and then there's some area-specific variations depending upon traffic and other conditions. So does anybody know what PG6428 really means? I mean, it's not the uh, age of the people who should be watching the movie. What, what does the 64 and the 28 mean in the PG?
Well, it's not it's not a uh, movie thing. It's a temperature. Yep. Okay. So I actually don't read it the way a lot of people do. A lot of people read it 64, 28. I actually like to read it 64 minus 28. And the reason for that is it reminds me 64 is the upper temperature. Minus 28 is the lower temperature. Okay. I'm not going to get into the specifics. If you really want to look them up, you can. And it's in Celsius. So it's a 64 degrees. Okay. We would actually have to be 147 degrees in Fahrenheit. Okay. And minus 28. Okay. Is minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the range of temperatures you expect the pavement to see. The reason 147 isn't the air temperature. If it gets that hot, we're going to have a really bad day. But it heats up more because it's black. It's got the sun hitting it. You've all seen that effect. Minus 28, that is an air temperature based number. How cold is it really getting? Because if it gets too cold, the asphalt behaves different, becomes more brittle. So that's the range of temperatures. That's the idea behind the PG binders. And we developed a series of PG binders to be used in New York State depending upon traffic conditions. But when we started looking at it, yeah, there's some variations that exist in the PG. Most commons were the 6422 upstate and 6428. But we realized that we're just a few things missing. So from engineering standpoint, we started modifying things slightly. We started using more and more polymers. And we put some modifiers after the letter or between the two numbers, if you really think about it. So if you see the letter S in a, a current binder, that means it's just a standard, okay? There's nothing special about it. It might have a polymer, but it's not really designed for extra conditions. And E might be extreme. Uh, B is very high or H is high, just letters. It's sort of like Hogwarts. You know, you've got to look at the letters really mean. But the idea behind it is we use a different system, something called MSCR, Multiple Stress Creep and Recovery. Uh, Gary Nelson likes to call it Massacre. It does help you remember the acronym. <clears throat> but essentially, if you think about it, for PG binders, for most of upstate, most of the time, for most local roads, we're going to be using a 64 standard minus 22. If there's downstate near New York City, Long Island, we're going to probably be using a 64 high in terms of vari variability minus 22 most of the time. If there's a lot of traffic, and by the way, the picture shows cars, really probably should be looking more at a lot of trucks, but a lot, even cars can make enough difference. You want to bump it up a little bit upstate or bump it up to the extreme downstate. And why less binder choices? Well, most of the time we don't need the big variations. Better to have binders we really understand and use well than to try to go crazy. Now let's talk a little bit about the aggregate. The aggregate is what we drive on. It's the single most important part of the mix in some respects, because if you don't have good aggregates, if they polish, if they break down, they're not going to work. And we need to have both coarse and fine. The fine to help fill it, fill it in, make it dense, just like we do with a gravel mixture on a base of a roadway. And the coarse, strong, big, hard rocks with crushed faces, that is what we actually drive on. Next time you're on a, outside, maybe you're outside now, Look down and you notice the asphalt's been worn off, okay? You're driving on rocks, okay? Buy whenever you can from a DOT approved source. Why do I wanna buy from a DOT approved source? Why is that actually pretty important? Why? Quality control, yeah. Somebody else has done some testing. They've tested it to make sure it can handle freezing and thawing, that it's got the angularity, that it's got the strength, okay? That it gives you what you're paying for. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in terms of what you have for a specification. But you really wanna have a good quality material. Don't skimp on the aggregate, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about the mix types. Hot mix, cold mix, and warm mix. We make them hot, cold, or warm because what we're really trying to do is take a product, asphalt, which is pretty solid at room temperatures, even up to 147, it's at best sticky. We're trying to make it liquid enough to coat the rocks, to hold the rocks together. So we have to heat it up in some way or make it liquid in some way. With hot mix, we do that by heating it up to 
300, 325 degrees, which by the way, we're actually talking about one of our uh, tech tips we're putting out. And we're talking about burns this morning. An asphalt burn is not a good thing. Uh, even a small one can do some serious damage because we're heating 300 and something degrees Fahrenheit. That's one way to make asphalt a liquid. Another way to make it liquid is to heat it up a little bit in the mid hundreds, uh, upper side of that coin, mix it with water or they used to use actually gasoline and diesel fuel, uh, cutbacks and things like that, and make a colloid like a salad dressing and you make a liquid out of it and you can get a pretty good mix. Cold mix, I like cold mix. It's got some real advantages in some places. And then a third way to do that is warm mix, where you sort of heat it up a little bit more than cold mix. So you've almost got a liquid form and then you either add a chemical, a wax, or you uh, put, make it into a foam by blowing air through it and allow you to coat the rocks. At the end of the day, it's still asphalt. It's still rocks. It still comes from plants. You're just gonna have some minor variations in how you place it and how you roll it. But the point is, make sure you've got a mix you understand and you're using properly. So we're gonna focus just a minute on hot mix, just so you understand there's different hot mix types from surface all the way down to the base and the binder materials. And that's the size of the rock you're dealing with. And while everybody likes that smooth rock that's up there on the upper left, really fine sand, it's more prone to rutting. It's not got as much strength to it in a lot of ways. So while you might want to use that in a residential area, if you've got a lot of trucks, get some rocks in there. Go with a little bit coarser top. Okay, it won't be quite as quiet, but at the end of the day, I want strength as an engineer, okay? But on the other hand, you can't pave the surface of a roadway with a binder layer. That's not going to hold up. It's going to strip. It's going to be very noisy. Those rocks are going to ravel out. You got to put a surface type material on at the end of the day. Okay, and then in terms of the mixes available, New York State has a nice laundry list of super paved mixes. So you can see the base, the binder, there's a shim layer if you need to fill in those ruts we talked about earlier, or a top. Pick the right mix for the job. And how do you order the mix? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Okay, now there's a code. You know, we love codes, we love acronyms, things like that. But if you think about it, you're gonna order super paved mixes. It's 402, that's the state spec number. Your thickness is in millimeters. You're gonna have compaction, friction, and quality adjustments. And then the revision is just the number the state uses. So let's go back and look at our super paved mixes. This is the list of the super paved mixes. What we really should be doing here is we really should make sure we have two digits in front of the decimal point because everything is still ordered in metric units. Okay, even though most of us I know are U US, US customary, Think about the number in front of the decimal point. So if I was gonna be ordering a half inch top, dense top, that would be 12.5 millimeters. I'm gonna go smaller, a little bit smaller, three eighths. I'm gonna order a 9.5 or 0 0.9.5. So when I come over here to order my actual mix, if I was gonna order a 9.5, it's actually just 0 0.9. We dropped the, anything past that decimal point. That's in millimeters. Okay, the compaction is just, are we gonna measure it with density gauges? Are we just using a method spec? Most of the time we use a method spec, so we just have a single number, eight for the 80 series. Friction, uh, most friction in New York State, we can just get away with a three, but maybe it's a little higher, we wanna go with a two. We're worried about friction courses. Quality adjustments, if you need them, most of the time we don't need them on the local system. And then the revision is just the spec revision number within the state. So I would be ordering a 402.09. And then everything else after that is just the ticket number that I need to get. But most of the time, we just can call that a 402.09. Okay. So let me ask you this. Let's say I ordered, I want to order a little coarser. What would be the minimum thickness for a 402.12 top course? Is it one half, three quarters, one, or one and one half inches? I'm gonna relaunch the polling if the computer will let me. And yep, there we go. So what do you think the answer is? What's the minimum thickness for a 402.12 top course? Uh, 
Okay, we'll see if we can get half here. Okay. Oh, this is a fun. We got all kind of variation all over the map. Okay, we'll stop this poll. Share the results. Most of you said one inch. Okay. Here's the way you want to think about it. The size of the mix, remember, is in millimeters. So it's actually 12.5 millimeters. Okay. 12.5 millimeters is one half an inch. If you have it too thin of a mix, what's going to happen is it's going to get dragged by the screed like you see in the picture. You're not going to get a nice edge. It's going to ravel. It's going to have all kinds of problems. So if my nominal particle, largest particle size is half inch, how thick does that lift need to be without raveling? Anybody know? If you know that, you'll know what the answer should have been. Let's see if anybody's going to be brave enough to guess this morning. Ah, now you're thinking, yeah, you actually need three times the nominal particle, largest particle size. So if it's a half inch particle size, Anything less than three times that or an inch and a half, you're going to have problems, okay? You're going to drag. You're going to have issues. If you need to do a shim course, you need to order that thin shim course. Don't go too thin. Otherwise, you can get a mess, and actually, it doesn't help drainage. It doesn't seal the surface, and it's not going to really last as long as you want it to last, okay? Now, you need to have a good spec to know all of this, and where do you get a good spec? Well, just think about how paving gets done for you. You're going to have to probably go out to advertise for a bid unless you're doing it in house. And even then you're still going to be using a specification. Okay. Now let's be honest. A lot of times we get the contractors to help us develop specifications and that's a great way to get started. But remember the contractor, if he gives you a spec, he's writing it for himself. Okay. When you write a spec, he's going to know your spec better than you are. So keep that in mind as well. You can prepare your own bid and that's fine. I have no problem with you doing that. But my advice is go find others who've already set up bids, okay? The county you're in, or the, if you're with the county yourself, you've probably got specs you've used for years. Those specs are pretty good usually. They've built up over time. Because of piggybacking rules, make sure everybody can piggyback on each other and you can borrow somebody else's bid. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, okay? You can even use the Office of General Services, which is really the state DOT specifications with some limitations in it. Go get a good set of specs. And as a starting point, obviously there is the New York State DOT standard specifications. Super PAVE is section 402, as we've already talked. You need a good spec. More and more we're going to away from method specs, going away from method specs and more to quality specs that say, hey, what do we have at the end of the day? But whatever your spec is, make sure you understand it and that you trust it, okay? And for those who are wondering what's super pay, what's the big thing, you know, we've been using it since the mid-90s. And we had some stumbles at first. And I've heard lots of good descriptions for super pay. I've also heard a lot of people who, well, they weren't the best description. But I describe super pay as this. We figured out what worked, what didn't work. We added some specialty uh, ways we make the samples. And... We made up a mix specification that way. And what's the biggest difference? It's a mixed design process. It's not just the pucks themselves. But the concept is instead of making the asphalt slugs we test in the laboratory by hammering on them and dropping them, we use a gyratory compactor. Okay. So if you've got this specialized machine, instead of having a flat plate in here, it's at an angle. I'm exaggerating the amount of the angle that's on there. But that needs the surface much closer to where a roller or traffic is actually going to need it. And that actually allows you to lower the asphalt amount and you get a denser puck, which is actually closer to what you get in the field. And that's a pretty cool technique. So a lot of times we're targeting about 4%, plus or minus a little bit, depending upon the traffic conditions. Okay, that's what super pave is. Okay. But make sure you've got a spec that you know and you understand. We could spend a whole hour talking about specs. I wish I had more time. But let me just, because I'm curious myself, 
what specification do you use the most? Do you use a state spec? Do you use a county spec? Do you use some other local spec that you've piggybacked off? Or do you uh, go get one from the vendor? I'm just curious, what are y'all using? What's the most commonly used spec that you're using for asphalt concrete? Okay, got half of you in there at least. That's cool. And a couple people putting in the chat pod because maybe they don't see the poll. Okay, so most of you are using a state spec and that's really good. Because again, nice thing about a state spec, the contractors all know that spec. So you're gonna get a lot more consistency in that particular respect. But the state may not have a particular spec. For instance, they don't have as many cold nicks variations that exist. So there you're probably gonna to have to use a county or local or modify. So keep in mind having a good spec, know that spec really well, because I know the contractor will know the spec better than I do, okay? From an engineering standpoint, if I had to pick something beyond getting the right foundation, getting the right mix, it's when we pave. You gotta pave at the right time. That's absolutely vital. So let's just look at hop mix as an example, okay? Now this is a chart. This particular chart is for a given air temperature, okay? So there's actually three dimensions on this chart. It goes in and out of the screen, if you could think about it that way. So you've actually got to look at the temperature of the ground, the base temperature, what are you paving on top of, okay? You've got to look at the mat thickness, the bigger the thickness of the mat of asphalt, the longer and more heat it's going to have, it's going to retain that heat longer. And then you've got the air temperature, how quickly it's going to cool off. And that also includes cloud cover, rain makes of course a huge difference, things like that. But let's just look at this particular chart to help you understand what I'm talking about. So. Along the x-axis is the mat thickness, and the base thickness is the different colors. So if it's 90 degrees, you've got more time to get that hot mix rolled before it's too stiff to properly roll, okay? As it gets colder, you get less and less time, okay? So if it's a cold day in late fall, you know, that green line, it doesn't get extrapolated down because, you know, you really don't have enough time then because it's gonna get down here into less than five minutes to get it properly rolled. And even if you had a bunch of rollers right up against the paver, you're just not gonna be able to get density. So you've gotta get it rolled in time. So you may actually wanna think about a thicker mat than you might normally. You might wanna go one lift rather than two to get that rolling done in place, okay? Uh, the question in the pod was, is that surface or air temperature? The base, um, that base, there's two ways you can draw this graph. Okay, I've seen it both ways. This particular one, the base, we're talking about the surface temperature. The third dimension that you can't see, this is, this is for a given air temperature. And I have to admit, I was looking at my notes last night and I don't, I don't remember what air temperature. This is for a given air temperature, this particular set of data, okay? I'll give you a tool in a minute where you can actually calculate all this out. It's actually pretty cool. You don't have to worry about it too much. Someone else has done the work. But the point is, as it gets colder in the fall, you've got less chance to get that rolled. If it's a cool day, you've got to do that. So that's why we have weather limitations, okay? They come into play. Now, the number one thing you gotta do, by the way, this is not just a temperature getting compacted. It, pavement really needs to be dry, okay? If you got a lot of water on the surface, you're not gonna get a good bond, tack coat or no tack coat. And the DOT has a whole bunch of requirements in their spec that involve lift thickness, surface temperature, and some seasonal limits, okay? So for instance, if you're downstate, your seasonal limits are from April 1 to November 30th, okay? If you're upstate, it's April 15th, i.e. when the plants open, until October 31, okay? And the state will actually allow you to go outside of those if it's warranty work. But truth be told, what they found is when they've gone back and looked at warranty work, even with a warranty, a couple of years later, half or more of the jobs have problems because they couldn't get the density. It didn't really do what they wanted it to do. It gets too cold at night. 
it doesn't actually get the density, it doesn't bond, it doesn't hold up as well as it should. So you really want to stay closer to the center. In fact, if you look at it from the standpoint of time of year, if we were paving now in July, I'll put a J down here for July, the chances of success are pretty high. But if I go and I go here to August, they're not, they're not quite as high, a little bit less chance of success. And I could draw a curve, which sort of says chance of success. And of course, by the time you get down here to the end of November, even downstate, they're starting to get pretty low. If I start too early, the ground is too cold. It's starting too early. So what I'm really trying to do is set my limits to improve my chances of success. But the further you get from the optimum time of year, the less your chances of success. So as you're thinking about it, when do you want to pave? The closer to the middle of the summer, the better. Now, this has been a hot year. We're going to get probably a little bit longer paving season. But watch that weather real carefully, because if that ground temperature starts to get cool, you're going to have problems, because you don't need temperature just the day you pave. You really want it for some time afterwards, so that asphalt concrete has time to really set up properly and traffic finishes the job. So be careful about the limits. Pave closer to the season than you can. And that's for hot mix, okay? And of course, what do you do when it rains? I mean, what are you gonna do when it starts to rain? What do you do with your paving job? Do you just shut the job down? What do you do? What would you do when it rains? You can put that in the Q&A pod for me. You could slow the lay down down, okay? You could lay what's already in the trucks, depending on how heavy the rain is. You could postpone temporarily. If you've got the trucks covered, you've got a little bit of time. You can watch the temperature in those trucks, okay? Don't load any more up, okay? The, the operators at the plant want you to. Get that silo emptied, okay? Leave it in the silo. <laughs> There's no point in putting in a truck so it's going to start to cool down on you as much as you can. But of course, these days with the internet, with our cell phones, we can see the radar coming. Hopefully, we don't get caught by that. But maybe the trucks you've got, but depends on how heavy it is. Okay, I've been on paving jobs where it's a light rain. We'll get the trucks emptied. But if it's a heavy rain, I'm just going to hold them in the trucks. And if it rains for too long, well, like it or not, you may have to eat some trucks. But better that than the put down material that you're probably gonna have to tear back out later on. That's really not fun at all. Nobody wants to do that. So you may have to halt production. Certainly you definitely wanna slow down at the plant. Keep the loads covered. You might place what's produced, again, depending on how heavy the rain is and slow the paving rate down so that you can get those rollers right up behind the paver to get the density in there to get it rolled so the rollers have a better chance, okay? So you can roll it quickly, okay? And you may need to put more passes down, uh, but something to be aware of. Now, we talked about hot mix limitations. What do you think the seasonal limits are for cold mix? Okay, so again, I'm just gonna re relaunch the polling. It's sort of fun, I get to use the same poll question. So what do you think of the seasonal limits for cold mix? April 1st and November 30th, the same as uh, downstate hot mix. April 15th, October 31st, the same as Upstate hot mix, May 1st, October 15th, or Memorial Day to Labor Day? What would you choose for cold mix? Okay, we got quite a var variation. I'll go ahead and end the polling and I'll share the results. Cold mix has to be placed earlier and has more risk in the spring because it's got to cure out that asphalt emulsion, okay? So truth be told, for Upstate, Memorial Day to Labor Day, towards the end of May and really by the beginning of September, you want to have it down. So it's got time to cure in the fall and the ground temperatures have come up enough to where you're not going to have density problems. So again, depends on the year, but generally we like Memorial Day to Labor Day because if you don't do that, your chances of success go down. So keep that in mind. And by the way, warm mix, interesting thing about warm mix, if it's done properly, 
you can actually extend the paving season. It's pretty cool, okay? You need to have good QA, QC. Now, how do we ensure quality? Well, it depends, again, if it's cold mix or hot mix or even warm mix. Quality control is really about who's measuring things with control, that's numbers. So you're measuring the ag aggregate emulsion and compatibility. If for cold mix, you're looking at the mix design, you're checking the daily production of the mix. That's quality control, things you measure. Quality assurance, that's those things like your pre-paving meeting, checking out the equipment, making sure everything is calibrated, taking random samples. Now, I know people will say, wait a second, isn't random samples isn't sampling and testing quality control? Testing is quality control. Taking the samples is quality assurance. I hope, raise your hands, put your, down the hand on the chat pod. The last time you did a chip seal, I know we're talking about paving, but the last time you did a chip seal, did you take a sample of the emulsion? Raise your hand if you do. Every single time you do a chip seal, take a sample of the emulsion. Uh oh, nobody's raising their hand. Trust me, that's some of the most important quality assurance you can possibly do. Take a sample of the emulsion, take a sample of the stone, take a sample of the mix. You never have to test it. But if you don't take the sample, how are you going to do that later on? One of the best things you can do is to take samples. You don't have to always test them, but if you don't have the sample, you can't test later on. It's really hard to test back, especially with cold mix products. But even with hot mix, trust me, take some samples. It's worth doing, okay? With hot mix, slightly different because again, the uh, asphalt's just been heated up. It's a different process. So there's gonna be some QAQC at the plant. There's gonna be some QAQC in the laboratory where they're measuring things. And in the field, you're gonna be doing some measurement in itself. Um, who does the density measurement for those who are doing density? Who, who does the measurement? Put it in the Q&A pod. Who would you have go and check the density with the, either the new gauge or the sonic gauge, or even just to count the number of passes with the roller? Who would you have do that? An independent lab, an, an outside contractor? Yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah, third party lab. A lot of times the specs are written so that it's actually done by the contractor, okay? But remember, if it's the contractor doing it, how do you verify the work? So it's a balancing act. I understand why we like to put it into the contractor's cost, but how do you make sure that it's being done so that you get true independent measurements? And make sure you get papers, make sure you get the copies. These days we're doing things more and more electronically. In fact, there's some movements with COVID to eliminate the need for the actual paper ticket to do all electronic tickets. I like that idea. I think in the long run, it could actually be really cool. But take those measurements. That's again, sort of a form of quality assurance and quality control. And I think the single most important part of a good paving project in terms of really getting the QA, QC is that pre-project meeting where you sit down and you figure out what's really going on. Whether you meet in the office or on the job site on the first day, make sure everybody's on the same page on what's really important. Where are you gonna put your efforts? Where are you gonna put your time, okay? So quality control is primarily the responsibility of who, okay? And again, I'm gonna relaunch the polling and I'm gonna let you guess, is it the contractor, the consultant, the owner, or everyone? I, I hope this is an easy one. Let's see if I can get half of you. Yay, everybody got it just about. Thank you, good. Yeah, it's everyone's responsibility, okay? Good quality control and quality assurance is really the responsibility of everybody. Yes, particular people have different roles to play, but it's really important that we're all on the same page, which means we need to have the right equipment for the job, okay? You gotta have the right trucks, okay? That's absolutely vital, okay? Whether they're flow boys or dump trucks, they need to be clean, they need to have smooth beds, you need to have your waterproof tarps on the top of them, use them, uh, don't use fuel oil to as a release agent, 
because people go, well, it releases. Yeah, but remember, fuel oil is going to dissolve the asphalt. That's probably not really a good idea. You know, don't use the things that are actually going to dissolve the asphalt. Okay. The biggest thing I see with trucks, though, by far as an engineer, is we don't have enough trucks. So let me just ask you this. How many trucks do you need in this particular case? I got five minutes to discharge the truck at the paver. It's a 35 minute drive from the site on average to the plant. And it takes about 10 minutes to get my truck loaded at the plant. How many trucks am I gonna need? How do I even figure that out? Well, it's an easy way to do it. All you gotta do is calculate the cycle time and divide it by the paper time. So in this case, a starting at, it's a 70 minute round trip to get to the plant. And I've got 10 minutes at the plant and I've got five minutes at the paver. So that's an 85 minute cycle time. Okay. And I'm at the paver for five minutes. So if I divide 85, by five, that equals 17. Did everybody get 17? I hope so. So the calculations say 17. How many trucks do I need? In the Q&A pod, do I need 17 trucks? Somebody put in 19. Yeah, I'm gonna bump it up. Why am I gonna bump it up slightly? I want a couple of extra trucks. I don't want any more than I have to but I definitely don't want to be short. Why do I actually want a couple of extra trucks? What reasons might I have? You might have a breakdown of a truck, absolutely. There might be a problem at the plant. Um, did I include in my cycle time chance for the uh, driver to take a break? Uh, it's unrealistic to not assume they're gonna do that. So. Having too many trucks is vital so that, yes, the paver doesn't stop. That paver stopping is one of the worst things you can do. You'll see that in the video that uh, Gary put together. Absolutely vital to deal with the reality. Having too many trucks is not a problem. Now, the honest truth is, all of us know, usually that's not the problem. It's usually the other way. We don't have enough. But that paver, absolutely vital. You need to understand it. No, make sure the automation is working on it properly, that it's doing things properly if you need to. Absolutely vital is to have a good paver and a paving crew. You gotta have the right rollers for the job, whether they're vibratory is set up properly. Be careful with vibratory in an urban area with old water lines, by the way. You may find where the water lines are old the hard way. Uh, you can use rubber tire for asphalt too, they make them. And in some cases, if it's a rough road for the first lift, it could actually be a very good idea. But what do you think is the most important piece of equipment on the job? What would you say? And I'll let y'all guys vote here. What do you think is the most important piece of equipment on the job? Yeah, yeah, just about everybody's, yeah. You could argue that one's more important than the other, but I actually like what y'all are saying, because I agree with it. They all have an equal role. They have a different role to play, but it's a pretty important to understand they're all part of the process. And I didn't put it on here because some people don't think it's a piece of equipment and it isn't. But what is the most important part? It's really the operators, it's the crew. We really need to all be working together and it's that brain power that we bring to the job that's really important to help us place and compact the mix, okay? We gotta avoid segregation, okay? That's, you get that in the mix, you're gonna have a problem. And it shows up in the mat. And once you see that, uh, you're gonna have a bad day. You're probably gonna either have to seal it or take it back out, neither of which are great, okay? You need to make sure that you've got the proper head of material in the paver itself. What do you notice missing, by the way, here in this particular picture? I love this, it's actually part of a video. It's a beautiful video showing how the material works. I like it, but what do you notice missing right in front of that asphalt mix? Yeah, there's no tack coat. <laughs> you gotta have tack coat. If I had to pick the one thing I don't see enough of is tack coat. You gotta have that. If you see delamination like this, I bet there's no tack coat. 
you've got to get tag coat down. And then when you're done, you got to compact it well. Okay. And by the way, th these little guys here, they make it nice surface. Uh, I know in a main job, we wouldn't use them, but even on the small patches, do me a favor, compact it with something that's actually got some energy to it. Okay. And if you're going to do compaction, yeah, we don't normally do the cores. We don't normally do the density measurements, but if it's an important road, it probably is worth it. That little bit extra cost for good QA, QC is probably worth it. But if not, most of us for the local system, we use 80 series, which really means we just count the number of passes with the roller and we call it good. Uh, that's an issue. How do we know we're getting enough? How do we roll strategies? Well, there's actually a pretty cool thing. All you gotta do is go on the web and search for the word pave cool. It'll come right up and there's a web a site you'll come to and you can download this little tool that will actually help you figure out how many rollers you need, how long you've got to roll it, can really help you out figuring out when to pave. And you can actually set it up for even cooler mixes than just hot mix. Okay, I like it, it's a pretty cool little tool. So what do you think is the least important for long-term pavement life? If I had to pick, I'm gonna give up one of these four items, which one am I gonna give up? And I'm gonna relaunch the polling and let you vote. Okay. What do you think is the one I can give up? I'm going to end the polling. I've got the 50%. And interestingly enough, you said the number of trucks. I would actually say measure density. From an engineering standpoint, I want to measure density. I really do. But I'd rather have more trucks. If I have to spend my money, I want more trucks because I get that nice smooth mat. And I know that's going to make a big difference versus measuring density. I'd like that, have that. But in my order is density and then everything else. And by the way, to get the paving temperature, you can measure it with a gun. I actually like the probe that goes into the mat myself. Uh, I think that's actually a better way to do it. Okay. Now, Couple of more things, we're running uh, about where I wanna be. I wanna talk about improving safety and you're thinking, but Dave, we're paving. Well, doesn't mean we have to not think about safety, okay? Now the traditional butt joint, this is actually from our book. The traditional butt joint shows an overlap of a half an inch. Really, that really probably should be, and you'll actually watch the video with uh, Gary, you'll see it actually should be about one and a half inches of overlap with the old butt. There's a slight taper. And you wanna really get that asphalt beyond the slight taper, okay? So you really wanna come over here past that slight taper point. If you're not sure where it is, actually take your carpenter's rule you're measuring the thickness with, stick it on the ground or a straight edge and step on it, and you can see where it's actually sticking out. So you actually wanna get over a little bit. But beyond that, you want that overlap for density. That's really important, but it's also a safety issue, which is why the idea of the wedge joint the wedge joint improves density, but it also improves safety a little bit. So the most you've got over right here is about a three quarter inch to one inch notch. Okay, and even that's probably the most I would wanna see. I like three quarters better myself, but you, the wedge joint gives you better density, but it also improves safety. Because the most important factor with pavement drop, drop off crashes, danger is well speed, of course, how fast people are going, the experience people have, the vehicle themselves, but it's the drop off height that makes a difference. And if you've got a big thick lift, you can have an issue. And of course, if the edge of the pavement is sharp, that can make a difference. Now, this is from a report that was done in terms of uh, by Texas Transportation Institute. And they looked at the issues of safety depending on the shape of the edge of the pavement, whether it was straight or the rounded that we would normally pave. I don't like the word safe down here. I'd rather this say safer safer, okay? Because it's not safe, it's safer. But the flatter the shape, the safer it's going to be. The better chance for someone to not go off the road, okay? So while you're paving, you can actually put safety in, okay? And so this is something called a safety edge. The picture doesn't show it very well, but the actual angle there is close to 30 to 35 degrees. And that improves safety because when a vehicle goes off, it's a lot 
more control if it tries to pull back onto the roadway. And there's actually a second reason I really like it. I'm gonna show you two videos. We'll start them up both. And you can see the paving going on with and without a paving shoe to give you a safety edge. And you can see how behind the paver, where actually you can see better density that you get out of that, a smoother surface that actually lasts longer, okay? In fact, without the edge, even until you back it up, it's a more stable mix. And I really like that, okay? In fact, watch this video here. This is the day after they did one lane, okay? And watch these trucks. Normally, you would expect a truck on the edge of the pavement to just damage it like crazy. But look at this, almost no damage at all. You get better density and you get improved safety. Talk about a win-win, okay? Now, you still need to go and back it up. Don't leave it exposed, though people have done so. And you can see it lasts longer. But it's a very easy thing to do. And it can really improve safety and the durability of your pavement. From an engineering standpoint, I really like that. So what do you think about safety edge? So let me just see what you think here. So are you gonna try something like safety edge? Do you already use it? You're not sure, eh, probably not, or maybe not. I hope it's a maybe at best, okay? So about half of you have voted, okay. Well, you know, I'm glad to see of one thing. Nobody said maybe not. You're not sure, I can understand that, but try it. And I know of at least a couple of you that are using it, it's, it's cheap insurance. And it does give you time to get back in there and back everything up, okay? So I'm a big fan of it. And from an engineering standpoint, it really helps both the durability and the safety. And then finally, I don't wanna forget about performing maintenance in the future. A lot of people, especially people who are not really close. Um, actually, I'll let me ask a, answer a question real quick. Does the paving need an attachment safe for safety edge? Absolutely, both for safety edge and the notch wedge. It goes in the paver. It's actually got an extra vibrating device that goes on to help give the density that it needs. And the different shapes for the notch and for the uh, outside edge with the safety edge, it's a special attachment. It just bolts into place. Okay, it actually isn't too bad. And um, I think I see Andy Avery on the call. Andy, uh, if somebody were to contact you at Shimon County, is that okay? Raise your hand. Yeah, Shimon County uh, has been doing Safety Edge and you can talk to them about it and how they do it in their spec. And it really works out well for them. And I think it's a huge improvement in safety and durability, okay? But again, with pavement, we gotta perform maintenance in the future. People think it's pave it and forget it. And it's not. The design life has to include the maintenance. It has to include the wearing courses, the chip seals, the crack repairs. That's part of the design life. And you need to be thinking about that. You might, because of budgetary concerns, have to think about stage construction. Maybe you need six inches, but I can only afford three. So I do three now and another three in a couple of years. You have to include that as part of the paving process. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. And after you pave it, you may get changing conditions. You may get more traffic. So you have to account for that. So as part of your paving, think about the maintenance. There's an everyday counts initiative. This is from the Federal Highway Administration. And one of the things they're talking about is pavement preservation. You got to preserve the pavement you've already got, whether it's with patching, with wearing courses, that's part of your process. So my last question, and then we'll get finished up here, is what is your typical design life for your pavement? Okay. Is it five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 20 plus? Okay, for an overlay. Let's see what people vote. I'll get to half of you at least. Okay. So for most of you, your overlay is 10 years. Okay. And that's fine. Again, you need to know what your life is, but are you really getting 10 years? Look at your pavements and see, are they lasting as long as you'd like them to last? If they're not, maybe you need to go more thickness. Maybe you need to go with a different design method. Okay, at the end of the day, um, it's pretty important to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so now I'm all done for the day. Uh, we're right a little bit about one minute behind 10. 
But with that, I want to thank everybody for joining in. You can download Asphalt Paving Principles or watch the video. The uh, links are in the chat pod. Um, but thank you for joining us. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. We're doing a Town Hall and Shared Services next week. We're doing culverts, guide rail, and gravel roads in August, and we'll probably be adding some more sessions after that. And remember, this recording will be on our website here, and uh, as soon as we get it up there, it takes a while for it to get uh, downloaded. With that, thanks very much for joining us. Hope you learned something, and uh, have yourself a great day. Bye-bye.